Hello, everyone, uh, and thank you for coming here. I was told that this, is, this time slot is considered to be lunch in New York, so, so it's very early, I'm told. So thank you for being here. Um, we're going to keep this really um, casual and improvised. Um, so I'm, what I'm going to do is uh, introduce one of the readers first, and then we'll kind of do a round robin with that. But before I do, I just want to say thank you to um, Kaya Press for putting this together, and thank you for, to Samsung for hosting us with this space. Uh, and to the few of my friends who are here, thank you as well. Um, I was saying to everyone that I, I feel like a country mouse being in, in New York. It's, a, it's such a big place. And here I am reading in this daunting <laughs> theater. It's, it's quite daunting. So um, bear with me if I get a little like twitchy or something up here. But anyways, um, so we're going to start with Margaret Ree. Margaret Ree is a poet, scholar, and new media artist. Her debut poetry collection, Love Robot, named a 200, 2017 Best Book of Poetry by Entropy Magazine, and awarded a 2018 Elgin Award by the Science Fiction Poetry Association, and the, and the 2019 Best Book Award in Poetry by, Asian, by the Asian American Studies Association. Her installation, The Kimchi Poetry Machine, is exhibited at the Electronic Literature Collection, Volume 3. Currently, she is an assistant professor of writing across media in the new, in the School of Media Studies at New School. And she also happens to be one of my mo most favorite individuals in the world. So, Margaret. Um, well, thank you so much, Trung, for that lovely introduction. Um, Trung is also one of my um, most favorite people and such a formative mentor for any poet that comes through San Francisco. Trung is the person who we have learned from um, in his teaching at Mills College or San Francisco State or Kearney State Workshop. And I have to tell you that um, the reading series he held at his um, beautiful apartment is nothing country. There's just the world there. So I just want to thank Trung again, um, and we're so happy to be here to celebrate um, his award-winning book. And so yeah, so this is how it looks like. Um, as you can see, there's like pieces of paper. So every time someone would take a piece of paper, uh, the poem would um, emit audibly, uh, and it would do so just by the trigger of light when the lid was opened. Um, but it would have the effect that the poem was coming out of the jar. And then you could take a paper poem, take it for free, and the idea was that they would like, you know, tweet back a poem to the machine. So then from there, um, and this was, you know, a number of years ago, and so, uh, I was interested in kind of writing through it and teaching some classes about this idea of the poetry machine and the intersection of poetry and technology. So I'll go ahead and just read a little from this book and see how it goes and feel free to like maybe um, we can keep time just to make sure. Okay, great. So this is like the table of contents that you see. Um, so there are, the idea is it's epistolary, there's def different letters, and this idea of a future reader in a world where, um, where books will be rare and um, where the questions around poetry and technology are being raised. Um, and so there's different meditations that I uh, write in this book. So I'll go ahead and just read from this um, first section. So this is letter one. I'm standing at the intersection. There is a window in front of me, an interface. I am inside, away from the cold. At first, what caught my attention includes, across the street, a woman in a black jacket and thick hat dancing, while a man, presumably her husband, films her with his cell phone, and she is laughing, and he is too. But he looks around in case anyone else is looking at them. I am looking, and they look to me like a couple, obviously having fun and loving in the cold. But what sustains my attention are not the humans, it's the machines. 
The machines here includes the cars, the many cars in various colors that pass by at moderate rates. Then the phone I glanced at because I debated whether to take a photo of the intersection from inside the store, and subsequently a second later, I wanted to check the time. Then the lights of the intersection, once red, now they have all turned green. Now a school bus appears, bright and yellow, um, in front of me, and if I could try to describe it again, I would say it's ongoing and sustained this yellow, a blight now, and I don't see any children's faces. It's on this day that I began to compose my first letter to you, meaning it's an official one, a kind of letter I sat down and thought about and wrote carefully before I sent. The kind of letter where I deliberated on the arrangement of words and the shape of my I's and L's as I wrote. But what kind of letter doesn't do this? Perhaps if I wrote you an email with one word or two words, yes or no, that would be the opposite, right? At some point as we got to know one another, there'd be more to write, and that's a story I'll share later on. A question I hope you find pleasurable to think about. What is more intimate, a poem, story, or postcards? A friend once said postcards are promiscuous, they are open, but letters are sealed and bare. Though I observe later, letters must be opened like a bottle and like a blouse. Okay, I lied, that wasn't a question, but here are two. What are poems and what are machines? So um, in the piece, I go on to discuss William Carlos Williams and his writing about the poem as a small or large machine. Um, and thinking about the interconnections of poetry and digitality. So I'll just go ahead and just kind of skip through um, this section just in terms of time. Um, but I guess as you can see, there are just poets that kind of um, fascinated me and I got kind of obsessed with thinking about them and their writing. And then also Twitter, right? And so these are kind of different images in the book. And I'll go ahead and read this second section and then end with a really short section. So the other person I was working on was not a poet, but um, a computer scientist, Alan Turing. And many of you might be familiar with him um, based on the Turing test or um, different films that have been about him. But I think what interests me most about Alan Turing is not only his sexuality, as a gay man during the 1950s, but also um, how he wrote about poetry in his computer scientific work. Um, so this is the section about that. So please um, forgive all the kind of <laughs> back and forth. There's a lot of uh, gadgets up here, um, which is a great thing, right, about being at Samsung. It's such a perfectly technological space for something like this. Okay. So this is letter seven. Computer scientist Alan Turing envisioned the possibility of a digital computer and artificial intelligence in his 1950 article, Computer Machinery and Intelligence. He did so through a game. The Turing test, a test that includes two humans and a machine. The Turing test is Turing's conceptualization of artificial intelligence, AI. For the game, there are three players, two humans and a machine. Turing posits the human interrogator must figure out if the player is a computer or a human being. And if the binary choices are undetermined by the human interrogator, then the computer is intelligent. Turing imagined the interrogator must determine between the human and the machine through a series of questions. So the key to this trick is not whether the machine is artificially intelligent, but whether the human could guess it was a machine. Can a human guess whether it is a machine? And if not, the game ends with the computer and machine being artificially intelligent. So in Turing's 1950 essay, Computer Machinery and Intelligence, which was published in the journal Mind, his conceptualization of AI and a universal machine relies on a syllogism. As computer historians such as Dyson, George Dyson and others have observed, Turing's vision of the universal computer and artificial intelligence was form formative to the conceptualization of the modern computer. 
And it was a game that Turing was asking us to reconsider, right? Reality and what we believe. This game predates social constru constructionist turns um, in theory, for example, and derives from a computer scientist in the 1950s. Th thinking through the analogy and imagining game in which a human, the interrogator, aims to figure out if another human and a computer are human or machine, this analogy between human and machine resides in and between legible, illegible, speakable, unspeakable. The game's winner, if you will, rests on whether the machine can fool the human interrogator or the other way around, or if the interrogator simply cannot figure out in between. Here, the game that Turing proposes and the future of AI rests again on dismantling a human-centered approach, where humans are prioritized and hierarchical to machines, so instead he offers a way out. Machines have agency, but it depends on what you believe. So more than 20 years will pass when mathematician Johnny von Neumann would grasp Turing's conceptualization and begin implementing and creating the early inceptions of the modern computer at the Princeton Institute of Advanced Studies. And so at this point, could we imagine Alan Turing writing at his desk? Maybe it's, a it's made out of plain wood and filled with papers. He adds a joke or two and smiles, perhaps. The world is still figuring out the brain and how did Turing consider performance as part of the machine game? Now it's becoming harder and harder to tell poetry and machines. Machines can write poetry like chat scripts and the lines are blurred in between. To create her compass poems, for example, poet and programmer Alison Parrish trained a machine learning model with two parts. One spells words based on how they sound, and the other spells words based on how they're spelled. Parrish selects a list of semantically related words, and the sounder out uses phono uh, phonetics to translate these words into numerical vectors. The speller can then predict a plausible spelling of a vector halfway between a pair of words or the midpoint of words of a list as points on a compass. Digital poet and programmer Darius Kazimi published his Twitter as a hybrid of, quote, all last word statements online of executed prisoners in Texas. Using a bot, the poignant po project transforms Twitter into a web page of remembrance of mourning and code turned into poetry. Kazimi used code to ex extract sentences where love reappears as poetry created by a machine in last words or occurrences of love in last words of executed Texas death row inmates. Quote, I love you all, I love you Israel, I'll always remember you and love you forever. Yes, love you mom, love you pop, love you Sarah and Amanda. I got to go sister, I love you. How to choose. Less known is Turing's test on gender. In it, the interrogator does not judge between a human or a machine, but determines who is a woman or a man, by hair, by voice, by desire. Turing transformed our world, the mundane. I'm typing on a computer, or rather we're surrounded by computers, opened on Google Docs. You might be on your phone, looking at your phone, texting your roommate, your mother, or your lover. The point is, our everyday life has been transformed by machines, imagined by Turing. So why gender? This has largely elapsed the public histories of Turing's legacy. Although he was um, posthumously, uh, homelessly pardoned for his sexuality by the UK government in 2013, Turing was queer, he desired men, and I have written elsewhere on Turing's sexuality and his later state-sanctioned punishment that transformed his body with hormones made him grow breasts. According to the magnificently researched and written Alan Turing, The Enigma by Andrew Hodges, it began with a young man, Arnold Murray, a 19-year-old unemployed man that Turing met on the street, a common occurrence, and they began a relationship. There is nothing as tender as a young man's touch in a homophobic world. Yet on January 23rd, Turing's house was burglared. His lover and the burglar were acquaintances, and Turing reported the crime to the police, unknowing what would arise. From there, the investigation probed the sexual relationship with Murray. In the UK, quote unquote, homosexual acts were 
criminal offenses, and he and Murray were charged with gross indecency of, of 1885 Criminal Law Amendment Act. And through the trial, Turing, with advice from his brother and lawyer, lawyer pled guilty. Prior to this, it was observed that Turing did not hide his sexuality from others, even sharing it openly with colleagues. However, within state-sanctioned hands, Turing, Turing only had two choices between imprisonment or probation. Probation would include Turing to undergo hormone treatment designed to reduce libido. As a form of estrogen, the treatment would leave Turing impotent and to grow breasts. Imprisonment meant a different kind of confinement, how to choose. John Murray was also convicted and their relationship broke apart. What is the, law, the loss here? He was later understood to commit suicide, found with cyanide poisoning and a half-eaten apple. The apple, ap apple as an homage to a man who made vision possible. Is it possible that that apple, the company, which one probably thought first was a technological homage to Eve, actually was something darker and more horrific of a symbol of a homophobic world? Turing's vision of the world was shaped and transformed by his sexuality, a sexuality that was unfairly deemed horrific. Could it be Turing understood the world in this way, creatively and queerly, which then opened up sight to consider the possibility of intelligent machines? How else do you survive a homophobic world organized against you at every turn, a map that dead marked your desires and beings in binary logics? In a 1952 letter to fellow mathematician Norman Rutledge, Turing wrote about his concerns on pleading guilty to the crime of homosexuality in that it would discredit his ideas of, on artificial intelligence. Quote, I'm afraid that the following syllogism may be used by some in the future. Turing believes machines think. Turing lies with men. Therefore, machines do not think. While his ideas weren't discarded, his sexuality and connections with queerness and digitality is often lost. There are many books on Turing that remarkably ignore his sexuality. And if we're in a time machine and we turn to the present moment, we can perhaps suffice that while AI continues to develop at a fast pace in our digital world, this story and the interventions of queerness and sexuality is omitted to the detriment of the initial impetus of Turing and his phenomenal ideas that caught across binary logics, because now we live in a digital world where his loss is still reverberating, a world of ones and zeros, binaristic, constraining gender and race, algorithms of repression. Some practical examples, Amazon once had an AI machine built to eliminate HR departments, then it was eliminated because when based on Amazon's past hiring practices and decisions, it excluded any female person, trolling, doxing, cyber stalking, what would Turing think? As the late queer theorist Jose Esteban Munez writes, quote, I always marvel at the ways in which non-white children survive a white supremacist US culture that preys on them. I am equally in awe of the ways in which queer children navigate a homophobic public sphere that would rather they not exist. The survival of children who are both queerly and racially identified is nothing short of staggering. As Munez writes, queer children of color navigate a homophobic public sphere that would rather they not exist, and the world did not want Turing to exist as he was. Turing was a child once, and while he was not a child of color, he also suffered the jagged slings of a world that was not ready yet to imagine. Though Turing wasn't non-white, as a white homosexual middle-class man in 1950s US and UK, and he was certainly privileged, he was still marked. Because of his sexuality, he confronted homophobia that's understood to end his life. Yet he saved us from the war and he also Im imagined the contemporary computer of today. And so given this, of course, you would imagine a machine that can change the world, this reality. Of course, you would imagine a poetry machine. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and end with a very short poem. Um, and so, um, as you can see, there's just different kinds of meditations and engagements with this intersection of poetry and technology. And um, 
some of the poets that I also write about include um, Mina Loy, who is a feminist and modernist, um, and the idea of the lunar um, uh, Baedeker, of sort of the mapping of the moon. And I also write about my mother. So I'll go ahead and read this and end and, and here. Lift me up, Oma, to the roof so I could see the moonlight and so I could see the reflection of your face into mine. I have your eyes and dad's face. My face is beautiful like the moon, you said, this lunar beta taker of mine. The thin paper writing, the Korean alphabet carefully so I can copy and understand. Sitting on the carpet, cutting with my scissors, paper dolls, sewing bean bags of flowered fabric I could juggle after school. Before I sleep, wrapping the blanket around each toe as I squeal in delight, taking us to high school, cutting in front of the cars uh, in line, working at the dry cleaners, a big machine with plastic covered clothes and how I ran past it into another world and shrieked when the machine moved. Even when my teacher gave me clothes with lipstick stains to take home to you, you frowned and sighed but you came back with clean clothes anyways, a flag of resistance. I show you dictate, the first time I read it, because there's a photo of the first Korean woman I see in a poetry book, and you tell me is you gone soon. The hamburgers made with American cheese, lettuce, and tomato on your day off. You make kimchi with your hands, um, a jarring cacophony of red, white, green, and dark pink gloves, and suddenly a full table and lush spice in our mouths now. Weary hands, cold feet, and as a child, I slid them on your chest. Now I see every gesture of living that's never canonized as survivance and a different kind of poetry. Immigration as a poetry machine, a different kind of lunar vetedeker. Thank you. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our next um, speaker, Catalina O'Young. Um, Catalina O'Young engages in object making, interdisciplinary environments, and time based projects to indicate counter narratives around representation and self definition. Through expansion, fragmentation, and abstraction, their work proposes the body as a politicized landscape subject to partition working agnostically with materials ranging from hand-carved wood and stone to appropriated literature and historic artifacts, Ouyang also attends to critical reimagining of historical formations wherein monstrosity, animality, and toxicity act as ciphers for the psycho-effective alienation of the minor subject. Oh Young's work has been the subject of solo and group presentations, including the Sculpture Center, the Aldrich Museum, the Jeffrey D Jerk Gallery, the Simon Lee Gallery in London, the Asian Art Center in Taipei, and many others. Oh Young re received an MFA from Yale University and lives and works in New York. Please help me welcome Catalina. Um, I'm going to be reading an essay that I actually wrote about a year ago um, for an exhibition catalog and um, it was an old friend who invited me to write it and her only sort of guideline was that it should address uh, visibility and resolution. The essay itself sort of moves between um, like original content and a bunch of citation um, so I'm trying this chaotic format where all the text on the screen is um, what is cited. So this is titled, The Weft is a Journeying Thread. The image is a ghostly Christ, arms extended on the cross. He holds up two giant rabbit fetuses, body bags. Through the online portal, on a dated pop-up screen, the JPEG looks spiky, ridden with static. Your x-rays came back completely normal, reads the message in the health app portal. 
there is no option to respond to the message. Sorry, I don't know if this is working. Press it hard. Okay, wrong direction. A normal, inside all of us is a Christ hauling the unborn, the bunny in our heart of hearts, what gives us breath, our lungs. In the x-ray, the clavicle makes up Christ's arms, the sternum, his forsaken body. The image composition functions like a cut paper scene displayed on a light box. Spatial dynamism results from layering and translucency. To make a radiograph, a negatively charged electrode is heated by electricity and its energy is directed toward a metal plate. The x-rays travel through a body, often because it is ailing, and are absorbed in varying amounts depending on the radiological density of what they journey through. Bone appears white in high contrast on a radiograph, whereas soft tissues and gas-filled cavities, such as the lungs, appear in shades of gray. The unborn rabbits, the zipped up dead. For months, I have had breathing problems on the subway, at the bar, at the dinner party, giving lectures, giving head. My breathing problems turn me into a worse lover. I have to take breaks for air. What happens to the body when it is starved of oxygen? Lightheadedness, cold sweat, loss of vision, brain on fire, finally brief euphoria. Wherever I am, whomever I am with, I swallow my un uncontrollable yawns, lift my arms to expand my rib cage, cross and uncross and recross my legs, attempt to continue constructing sophisticated sentences, hope my interlocutor does not perceive my glistening forehead and glazing eyes. Try to stay focused and chipper, try not to check my pulse visibly. Other nights, alone, collapsing, face down on the rug, fetal position, counting, waiting. Have you tried breathing exercises? My lungs feel shibori bound and icy hot. Try to focus on one object and describe it in detail. Word loss is one early trauma response. The brain suffers permanent damage after four minutes without oxygen. With reduced oxygen, you live, but get dumber over time. In these late, light, late night moments, punctuated by slick gasps, the, tr the cricket drone outside is a sadistic metronome, the moon a yellow half-truth. My apartment, a century-old carriage house covered in ivy tucked behind a yellow-painted main building and definitely illegal, is recent. I escaped here months ago. I had signed the lease in February, heady morning, sprinting to the G train, barely dressed, calling the Polish realtor, first one to view the place, failing to notice the absence of a kitchen sink, throwing a cash deposit at the agent. I secretly signed the lease that day in February and it remained a secret and I sanded the floors in secret and painted the walls and patched their fist size holes in secret and did not move until April, did not escape until April. For two months in my new slum, I was invisible. I told the person I will call my third cohabitor that I was working in my studio all those days. In leasing a secret slum, a person may be trying to resolve the existential problem of corporeal custody. Their decision-making may be, not for the first time, failing their own body. Resolution descends from the Latin solvere, to release, to loosen, release, undo. Later, resolvere, unyoke, relax, set free, make void, dispel. Resolution also pertains to solving a mathematical problem or settling a political conflict with a connotation of fixedness and finality. It, for the same reasons that so much of English makes no sense, encompasses diametrically opposed meanings. 
Another root from the late 14th century resolve in reduce to liquid, alter in form or in nature by application of physical process. I was trying to resolve the existential problem of a phantom attachment that had, over the course of a decade, or maybe an entire life, metastasized into the libidinal. The virgin Canis, raped by the god Poseidon, asks the god to prevent this in the future by turning her into a man capable of exacting revenge. You are lost, I think of her. All the same, I felt lost. I needed to alter something in form by application of physical process to my literal self. I needed to make void my tether. My lungs had given out once before, half a decade ago. At the time, I thought I had lung cancer, COPD, chronic bronchitis, silicosis, asthma. I smoked heavily and often skipped a respirator while working in clouds of plaster, resin, and stone dust. But the x-rays came back normal then, too. Now I recognize those bouts of asphyxia to have been a premonition, the compression on my ribs going off like an alarm, get out. Back then, I had the fearlessness of a young person, in love no less, and assumed I could handle the banal narrative of a domestic space I was ready to explode, assumed I was handling it every time it did explode. In the home of the person, I will call my first cohabitor, I spent long afternoons wheezing fearfully in bed. The ceiling had a popcorn texture and the walls were snot beige, the floor carpeted. We had a balcony facing the street with his bonsai trees and a rosemary shrub. The apartment smelled like the perfume I had bought him, vanilla, tobacco, teak. This smell followed me some nights to the front door as I struggled with the lock vision flooding red, leaping barefoot to my car before the smell caught up with me and hurled my keys into an asphalt fissure. The first time I nearly asphyxiate this time around, I have taken five heroic hits of a substance that had spilled out of a glass vial and crystallized, burned, and transformed into the unknown on my stovetop. It was not long after I had moved to the slum. I had not intended to stay up all night heating powder shakily over blue flame, but the sun rose without invitation. This layer of crystal flakes remained on the stove, agglutinating with paint and dust for about a month until, in the dead of night and out of new substance, I scraped it up with a penny and funneled it into the hollowed out chamber of a ballpoint pen. On the nights that I burned through all my Bic lighters, I used the flame from a vanilla and teak scented candle. I assume I have holes in my lungs. Sustained abuse of anything will give it holes. Holes are not bad per se. They are realms of pleasure and conduits of passage. I expect the x-ray of my lungs to return looking like Swiss cheese or a topographic map. I expect the x-ray to return looking like a Miro painting. In therapy, a frequent concern is self-sabotage, the parts that operate in opposition to the interests of the whole. Image resolution is a question of how close together the lines on the screen can get. Image resolution is a question of what you can and cannot see. Image resolution is a question of preservation versus deterioration of parts operating in accordance with the interests of the whole. Within four minutes of oxygen deprivation, a person's vision will give out. After the first time I nearly asphyxiate, I continue to get high every night. I work until four in the morning, commute until sunrise, and reward myself with a prolonged occipital burn. In the beginning, I do not know how to cook the substance correctly. When it is good, you are supposed to hear church bells. But even when it is bad, it feels like ice crystals blossoming in your alveoli. 
In between bouts of asphy asphyxia, I read about carbon monoxide poisoning from the stove residue, maybe. Prolonged exposure to carbon monoxide results in neuropsychological sequelae, including visual deterioration. Long-term carbon monoxide poisoning will eventually kill you. It is an incredible substance, without smell, taste, totally imperceptible, illegible, glissant's ideal gaseous form. To calm down, I press my hand hard into the left half of my sternum and leave yellow bruises in the shape of crescents. Lovers are never allowed to touch my sternum. This is, the sensation is unbearable, like I am being ripped in half. When did I first notice the feeling? Reciting the Pledge of Allegiance in kindergarten. A red schoolhouse in a yawning cornfield, a well in the front yard, reeking of sulfur, Place your hand over your heart. It was not my first affair with recitation, but it was my longest. Hand over your heart. My chubby toddler finger brushed my sternum, and the impact burned. This zone is off limits, I tell my lovers. Only I am permitted to wound myself there. My other affairs with recitation, it is OK. I forgive you. Yes, I am coming back. Initially, scientists believed that x-rays passed through flesh as harmlessly as, through light, as light. The burns and sickness came later. I believe that this skin damage, these killing illnesses, indicates this, the price of transparency. The layers cannot bear to cohabit in the same flesh province. The image they yield must annihilate. You should not be able to see through another person this way, not without barter. The prerogative of self-destruction is to retain a certain degree of illegibility. Some mornings, forehead against the mirror, muscles feeling atrophied, recalling the words hurled at me, you are emotionally abusive, you are toxic. Another province of opacity, wide stretches of time I cannot recall, where I become invisible to myself, unknowable and uncontrollable, Everybody else too burned to fill me in after the fact. My first and third cohabitors liked to drink. I lost track of how many times they resolved to stop. When violence is resolved, is it dispelled or is it altered in form? Poseidon, grateful for the pleasure of rape, turns Canis into the warrior Caeneus, invincible and eager for war. Canis syndrome, a triad condition of genital self-mutilation, hysteric personality disorder, and eating disorder, comprises a phenomenon where a survivor pays twice over, first in carnal violence, then in turning their fury not on their perpetrator, but on the very qualities that they consider responsible for the violation. My therapist looks crestfallen while saying to me, you cannot punish your body for what it did not do. A bad patient does not attempt to archeologize. On a Monday evening, I am arguing with a lover about a Voltaire Benjamin text neither of us has read. It is night. We are in the middle of walking 60 blocks from Lincoln Center to his sublet on Mulberry and have passed a facade resembling a Parisian arcade. I brought up the text and I regret it. We have taken mushrooms and I regret it. I am a week clean and my breathing has been decent. Now I hyperventilate with tectonic slowness. My limbs are being going familiarly numb. Being yelled at about theory has materialized the erotic horror of how loving means choking to death in yourself and coming to life in the other. Back at his apartment, the floor is covered in rotting roses pilfered from Whole Foods, innocent things mauled by his obscene sense of the romantic. On the back of his head, recently shaved, a tattoo reads in all caps, desire. I am tripping and cannot catch my breath. Loving a person with a tattoo like this makes me feel very close to death. Lying next to me, he giggles, sounding miles away. You are looking at me as if you have never smiled in your life. 
The apartment is cast in crimson by a red glass lamp. I am swallowed by its relentless vortex. I am being burned alive. My vision goes up in thermographic plumes. I picture the holes in my lungs spreading like spilled dye. In a place you reach for through your skin, light shoots through the calcified marrow of premonition and diffuses in a wounded gray chamber, dimly illuminating the image of desire. It may prompt you to make a deal with God and then walk away from it for the delight of grazing mortality and saying yes. Yes is not about consenting to appropriation. It is about surrendering to rupture. Two weeks later, my chest x-ray is cleared, a completely normal, generic Christ. I look at women, Carrie Mae Weems says. As a, at a house party, I look at a woman whose family, like mine, is from Beijing. I feel warm toward her. She is trying to open the bottle of wine she brought. The cork has split in half. A difficult cork is one way you know a wine is good. I open it for her, joking about my plenitude of experience. The wine is natural and tastes pleasantly like mead. I am attending this party with a new lover, and we both know nobody. The woman tells us she handles money for a large gallery that represents the artist who employed my first cohabitor after we separated. I spontaneously exit my body. The pupae of my lungs fissure open, the rabbits kick. I ask the woman if she knows my first cohabitor, and she says, oh yes, the surfer guy? The surfer guy. My first, my first cohabitor did not surf when I knew him. He expanded those horizons of his life after I was done knowing him. That guy raped me, I say flatly, feeling the air drain from my kicking, punctured rabbits. I am drinking too fast. I am drinking fast because I am a few days clean, but now I am harvesting permission to get high later. I ask the woman if she likes the artist's work, heavy, expensive, phallic, and she says yes. This sends me into a rage. The choreography in his last project was laughable, I rant. His writing, down to the most minute gestures, is contrived and misogynistic. I have the distinct feeling that I will die if she, this person who looks like me and not my first cohabitor, not like his stupid boss, does not come around to agree with me. I look at women in troubled spaces, Carrie Mae Weems says, in the troubled space of desire. I want this woman to see me in the troubled space of desire and to see that my anger comes from a gangrenous wound barred for years from resolution. I want this woman to understand that her defense of this artist's work typifies the travesty of our parts failing to act in accordance with the interests of the whole. I look at her, practically spitting in her face, the now ex-lover will recount to me the next day, horrified as they dump me for being emotionally abusive until an inky curtain of panic obscures her face completely from my gaze. Whatever happens next remains opaque to me. Our interaction is already dissolving as it happens. I cannot give myself over to it. Undo, make void, reduce to liquid. The very substance of our relation began in resolution, in medias res, and will not give itself over to catharsis. I look at women, says Carrie Mae Weems, and I do not. I lose sight of this woman entirely, and then I obliterate the void of her redacted body. It takes most people seven tries to leave for good. I was largely clean for five years. I lost track of how many times I have resolved to stop. I look at women, Carrie Mae Weems says. I once looked at a woman named Jerisha. She was my first therapist at the Center for Domestic and Sexual Violence Survivors in St. Louis. Counseling there was free and I was broke. It took four months for me to get off the wait list and when I arrived for the first session of my life, something had gone wrong I had forgotten about my appointment. I looked at Jerisha and 
She looked at me and saw who knows what disappointment, humiliation, ancestral hurt. I was hyperventilating but resolved not to cry. I left the center, vision tunneling into trodden gray carpet. Shell-shocked, I went to sit underneath a tree next to the highway. I had a book, I don't remember what. I was wearing acid-washed jeans with wide slits in the knees. I sat cross-legged in the dirt under the tree and I read the book trying to breathe. I read the book until I was calm. The sun arced across the sky, no clouds. Sometime later, Jerisha found me under the tree, approached slowly with her hands in her pockets. I looked at her, looking at me, and her face was slick with tears as she wept, seeing me. Thank you. I am going to introduce the star of the evening, uh, Trang Tran. Trang Tran is a multimedia artist who believes that art, be it poetry, cooking, sculpting, and even gardening, are his ways of thinking through the conscious of the times we live in. He is the author of six previous collections of poetry, The Book of Perceptions, Placing the Accents, Dust and Conscience, Within the Margins, Four Letter Words, and 100 Words, co-authored with Damon Potter. He also authored the children's book, Going Home, Coming Home, and an artist monograph, I Meant to Say, Please Pass the Sugar. His poems and books have been translated into Spanish, French, and Dutch. He is the recipient of the Poetry Center Prize, the Fund for Poetry Grant, the California Arts Council Grant, and numerous San Francisco Arts Commission grants. Trong lives in San Francisco and currently teaches at Mills College, Oakland. In the course of this book, the word motherfucker is used deliberately in excess. The word is used and someone laughed. The word is used in a sentence out of anger. The word is used as violence. The word is used and someone is offended. The word is used in context. My mother, if she knew, if translated, I think my mother would approve. The word interrupts. The word I'm told is just the word she calls every day at 8 a.m. My mother insists on interrupting my sleep. A Vietnamese man died this week, stabbed in the heart. My mother calls to tell me this. The word is used because I do not have another. Written again into this book, this need to wake, my mother calls to know that I'm alive. This man who died... I wonder if his mother is still awake. Another Vietnamese man is killed in the same week. My mother calls with news of his death. She calls to wake. She won't stop watching. Eight in the morning and my mother calls with details of how a Vietnamese man was killed and dismembered. The word is pushing through even now. My mother tells me the man they killed was about my age. He was 55 years old. My mother forgets how old I am. My mother tells me the boy who, boys who killed him are white, the age of my students. In the course of this book, I am thinking about the word and its use. I'm attempting to temper the word. This word I know is not just the word. I think about my mother all the time. Of the 8 a.m. wakes, she is fated to hold again and again for the mothers of those who have been hurt and killed, the mothers of those who hurt and kill. The word, my mother, this mother of a word. This book I've written is about um, discrimination, academia, in a lawsuit. When the older white colleague takes you under his wing, gives you advice, he tells you that you should make an effort to translate. He tells you, 
that all young academics should be translating. He brings Vietnamese poets from Vietnam. He brings them to his class. He prompts them to perform their poetry. He translates. He reads the translations of their poetry. He asks them to sing a Vietnamese folk song. He translates their rhythms. He leads by example. His students all translate. It's not about language, that awkward moment when you have been given advice unsolicited, unwanted. He tells you to translate. It's only natural after all. He assumes that English is not your first language. It's in that awkward moment when you have to respond. Well, actually, I only write in English. Perhaps one day I'll try translating, but not before I learn the language. It's in that moment, that awkward moment, when you are reminded that your life is lived as a life in translation. There are poems in this collection that um, we couldn't publish in, in the book for one reason or another, so we found different ways of publishing them. So these poems, uh, a couple of these poems are tucked into the, the sleeve of the book. The Five Obstructions, a poetry exercise. One, state of fact, this is not the same as the truth. Two, confront a lie, use profanity of your choosing. Three, ask a question. Something obvious but still unanswered. Four, identify an audience, then exclude. This is a good thing. Five, there's still something you did not say. Say it in the footnote. This, the five obstructions of poet, poetic exorcism. One, state a fact. Begin your statement with this motherfucker. Two, confront a lie. Use for profanity something like, hey, motherfucker. Three, ask a question. Ask it of a motherfucker. Four, identify an audience, then exclude. No need to name the motherfuckers. Five, still there's something you did not say. Say this in the footnote, you motherfucker. There's a footnote in this poem, and um, the publisher of the book really insisted on keeping the footnotes really small in font size, and that's when I learned how old I really am, because I can barely read the footnotes. So if I start stumbling around the footnotes, please bear with me on that. Um, this is not an easy story to write, to share, to be told that it needs to be rewritten again, that the memory of my friend refuses the crafting of a narrative, an audience. This is a poem that is not, that exists beyond these written words. Still, I am trying to tell this story, an old car that needs fixing, 381 miles, two strangers, a Chinese restaurant in the mission. The drive north, orange chicken, she insisted on something sweet for the occasion. Care and a word. This is a story about seeing. I saw her for the first time after months of emails back and forth hearing. She listened as I spoke. She asked a question or maybe two, but mostly she listened. She heard anger history, and still more anger. She reached for my hand, held it. I allowed myself to be touched that night. The story, something in exchange, held, I'm sorry, something in exchange, held it. I allowed myself to be touched that night. The story, something in exchange, somewhere in between. 
the awkward refrain of careful silence, of strangers meeting, becoming family. She gave me a gift. It was the kindest gift a person could give. She wrapped it in barbed wire, knowing it could, would cut a word tucked in a sentence. She whispered it. This is a story about language, the way she said it from across the table, pronounced it. Her voice is teaching me even now how to swim. Still, this is the story that is a question. How do you write? How do you say? What you know cannot be said. And this is the footnote. There's a pin attached to this word weighted with a soft A, the hard R. Pull it and it will detonate. My friend spoke a word that night out of care. That word whispered from across the table. She said it. She shared as a black woman to a brown man. And there and then I learned that even something shared out of kindness comes with a burden. I've kept it close for all these years. I've carried its weight and memory of my friend. I've written about it. I've failed. It's taken me years to write this and still years to write this. I'm afraid of what I've written. I'm afraid that I will never truly know the meaning of this word, what it meant to her, how she carried it in her body, why she chose to share this word that was never mine to claim or say, yet I will re always remember her for sharing it, for saying it, as if to say, I see you. Do you see me? I'll keep it right here, this word. I'm going to keep it in honor of my friend. I'll hold it, carry its weight. I won't put it down. Sometimes I write poetry and there's, there's a little bit of imagination in the work of poetry and sometimes poetry happens right in front of you. Um, and this is one of those instances. Um, in this lawsuit that I was involved with, I was deposed. And a room full of white men in suits all sat around taking notes. And my deposer walked in and walked in late, um, very dramatically walked in late. And she was a Vietnamese woman my age. And the two of us sat in a room surrounded by white men who then sat there taking notes as we performed our otherness in that way because um, we were having this conversation, this debate about what is discrimination, what is racism. And, and someone had to be a winner in that conversation. So, The fact is when confronting whiteness in the form of discrimination, you find yourself confronted by a Vietnamese lawyer in a room full of white people. She as the lawyer and you as the complainant in a room witnessed by a room full of white people, you and this Vietnamese lawyer are in a play. Two actors, one act. The fact is, you want to say, this is my life. You debate the legalities of discrimination. The fact is, you are fighting for the right to compete for a job. And she has a job. She is doing her job. The fact is, there needs to be a winner. There needs to be witnesses. The fact is, this needed to happen in the presence of white people. The fact is, you write this poem because you have to. This is your job. You are doing your job in the same way that she is doing her job. The fact is, you are doing the job of writing this poem for when the time comes, for when you can look back for her, for someone like her. The fact is, you write this poem for you, for when you can, for when you will see this for what it is. Dear Vietnamese lawyer doing the work of deposing, I wrote this poem. I wrote it to document an extraordinary encounter when two Vietnamese immigrants met in a room in a country that was not Vietnam. 
They played the lead in a play about whiteness only. It was not a play, but lives in play, yours and mine. I wrote this poem for you in the hopes that you will find this poem sometime in the future. The fact is, I could never have imagined this happening, happening as it did. Two Vietnamese immigrants in a room debating the constitution of being discriminated in full view of a room full of white people. The fact is, dear fellow Vietnamese immigrant, the fact is, dear you, if I may, might I ask as one Vietnamese immigrant to another, I ask this with no malice, as my mother or my father would have done had they met so someone from home. Where are you from? The fact is, dear white, all right. And this is the last poem I'm going to read from this book. Um, I'm hoarding language, the English language, for the, a time when this English language will be revoked, reclaimed. For when I will be told that writing as I have is deemed a crime, to write the truth is to run the hallway in search of an exit, even so, even when they want you to leave. They wait by the exit to catch you for leaving. All right. I'm going to uh, share a few pieces that are incredibly raw. Um, I wrote this while at residency at Deniston Hill, uh, and I'm grateful for the experience of, of being uh, at this residency. Um, and I had nothing but time and heat and empty spaces to work in, and um, it allowed me to really become an old man. And I'm actually not, I'm not complaining about that. And this, this is a poem, actually this is a story about some family history. On fiction, the truth, and all the things we cannot say. I am going to write this, I'm going to write it without judgment. This is about people and places from far, from far from where I am today, and still I am hesitant. I'm afraid that someone will question its validity, interpretation, or even its reach for the imagination. This is neither fiction nor truth. It is the piecing together of what I know, fragments and shards of lives of people I barely knew. I had an aunt my mother's oldest sister back in Vietnam. She was married to a man from what little I know from stories told, he was not a good man. He married my aunt and, two, had, and had two boys. He married a second and younger wife because he could. Because it was an accepted way of being. This is not a story about the man. I did not know him. I did not once call him my uncle. Shortly after his second marriage, he died of a somewhat mysterious cause. One relative said it was a heart attack. Another said he smoked too much. My mother, when asked, will just change the subject. He died. The end. This is where my story begins. My aunt has left... My aunt has... My aunt was left a grieving widow with two young boys and a woman she barely knew. What if I told you that they lived together? They raised the boys together, and the boys called them mothers and nothing more. They raised the boys to become kind-hearted men who married women who gave them children who called my aunt and my other aunt grandmothers. This would have been enough of a story. What if I told you that the two women took the money that was theirs by marriage, they bought some land, they built a home, they started a business, the younger of the two women sewed beautiful dresses, the old, older of the two women discovered her talent for doing business. She sold the dresses and made a killing. They lived through a war. They lost everything. They stayed together. They rebuilt their business. They rebuilt their home. My aunt lived well past her 80s. 
she died. Two years later, my mother, my, my, uh, my other aunt died. What if I told you that this is really a story about language, or better yet, the lack of language? I grew up thinking there was no word for who I am when spoken or written in the Vietnamese language, no word for gay or lesbian or trans. When I returned to Vietnam as an adult, I asked if I was, I was asked if I was straight or crooked. The man pointed and then gestured his finger. I laughed along. I was told that the word for gay was combined, the combined letters, initials of B and D. It stood for bong duk. Translated, bong duk means the shadow of a man. What if I told you that I saw my back, older auntie, and my co, younger auntie, both in their 80s before they died? I heard my cousin say, ma, mother, out loud. I heard my aunts respond, both at once. What if I told you that if you read this, what if they really what if the story is still just beginning? On writing a wrong and retelling a story. I wrote this story once before. I wrote it as a poem from, a perspective, from the perspective of a child, curious and perhaps still looking for a hero. The protagonist of that poem was a man, my uncle. He... I knew he liked to drink red wine. He liked smoking. Other than that, I knew very little about my uncle, except for the stories. Romanticized victories of war, of a war that was inevitably lost. I know even less about my aunt, whom I made into an inadvertent antagonist. I am, write, I am rewriting the story in sentences in the hopes of writing with certain clarity, of knowing, of finding this woman still inside, somewhere deep inside the story. She married an officer who rushed off to war. She married the stories of his heroism, of the battles won and battles fought, but never was there talk of any killings. She married into a life of waiting, waiting for life, waiting for death, waiting for the word for days and for weeks, waiting. She married into whispers, rumors, finding their way home of his betrayal, of his mistress and his love, his love of war. She married into seething anger. She listened to stories. She waited for the word. One day while waiting, as he was waging war still, she placed her hand flat on the table. She slid down her ring. She cleaved her finger with it intact. She sent it to him in a box with a note. To this day, she still holds a handkerchief in her right hand. She smiles. She laughs. She has a way of concealing the past. As I am the writer of the story, I am inclined to say that this was, this is a love story still. I could be wrong in my observations. They lasted the war with their marriage intact. They never had children. They shared a love for gone with the wind. He died of old age. She lives alone. I am told that she prefers it this way. By the way, the video that you saw here was something I did um, over 10 years ago uh, with uh, my friend Daniel Lichtenberg. We were filming a series of uh, art practices of mine, and I, one period of my life, I was stuffing hundreds of doll heads into little jars, and the jars just became incrementally smaller and smaller. Um, and that was, that was a filming of that, and I called it Metaphor. Little did I know that it was a metaphor for the book I was going to write 15 years later. So, so that, that was why you saw that. Um, 
And this is the last piece that I will read. And it was an addendum to something I read earlier. What if I told you that they were friends, childhood friends who became more than just friends? The older of the two protected the younger. She once fought a boy. She broke his nose. She broke her hand. She said she would kill him if he ever tried that again. What if he, whatever he did, he tried to do to the younger? What if I told you that the younger of the two, my aunt, Goal says that she was the protector that was her role all along. What if I told you that all this was born of the imaginal, imagination? What if this is all too real? Thank you. At this point, I'm going to invite Margaret and Catalina back up here in case anyone has questions for them, but... Thank you very much for being here, folks. Um, yes, the lawsuit. I, um, I worked at the same university for, for almost uh, 16 years. And um, I, I applied for a job. As a matter of fact, I applied for three jobs over the course of that time. And I was made a finalist each time. And each time they hired someone like their white husband, or their white copy editor, or their white friend. And I, um, it wasn't until the third, the, the third um, time that this happened that I finally filed a lawsuit because um, they disqualified my application after, after going through an entire um, uh, hiring process where I did everything. And then they said that somehow my, my my, my CV didn't match the criteria of the Written Job Act. And at the same time, they hired a man with a bachelor's degree in a different field who was their copy editor. So that was why I filed the lawsuit. And I, I got all the way to the end where I was about to go to court. And their response was, everything you said is true. They're, he is a copy editor. That was her husband. All of that was true. But none of this is discrimination because it's nepotism. And nepotism, I discovered in that, in that moment, is not a triable offense. And that is the university's defense. Nepotism is not a triable offense. So, so that was how I learned. And, and they were going to, they, they said that if, if this goes further, they called my lawyer and they said, hey, listen, your client owns a home. And if, if, this, if we continue down this path, we're, we're going to prove that it's nepotism. And that means that you will have to pay the, the, the fees for this lawsuit. So that, that was the, um, and so my lawyer being a, um, a uh, civil rights lawyer said, listen, I don't, I don't, handle clients who actually have property. He said, most of my clients are dealing with situations where, you know, it's a civil rights situation that property doesn't often become part of the conversation. He says, and, and if we look through the history of, of discrimination law cases in universities, he says, very few have ever been proven uh, because of things like this. So he says, they're offering us a settlement, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to suggest that you consider this. So of all that, the one thing that I, I came back to and I said, I, I don't give a fuck about the settlement. I said, but what I, what I will not accept is any kind of gag order. I'm going to write this book. And that's all there is to it. So that, that's how this book came about. And there you have it. <laughs> Poetry of <and> litigation. <laughs> yeah. Any questions for Catalina or Margaret? If not, we will let these folks wrap up. Thank you again for coming. <laughs>